Welcome everyone, I hope you had a great day. We're about to have our final keynote, but before we do, I just wanted to clarify um, that tonight there is a gala dinner happening at the same place where the reception happened last night. Um, but just to make sure that everyone knows, you needed to say you wanted to come and pay an extra fee to go to that dinner. So. Um, and, we're, and there's been some requests for us uh, around whether we can accommodate more people who would like to attend, but we're actually full right now. So of course, we had to let the caterer know how many people are gonna be there. And so, um, uh, so just, I just didn't want someone who thought that it was open and anyone could drop in to show up unexpectedly. Um, so we have a complete list of all the people who've said they want to attend and, um, and yes? Is there a subway strike on? Is there a sub a strike on? Is the strike happening today? No, the strike is happening on uh, Thursday, but it's not affecting us because it's the under, underground, not the trains. It's okay. There's no strike today. I think I'll do that. Fra for Friday's board meeting, I'm on strike. How about that? <laughs> Sorry, Willem. Welcome back for the last keynote of uh, this uh, great day we had. I have uh, seen a lot of people working a lot uh, in uh, the World Cafe, in the sessions uh, and so on. Now, uh, what about uh, this uh, new, very, very interesting uh, keynote? Y you know, always when we are talking about open education, we are talking about something that is uh, uh, closely related with the ethical issues and for sure with the notion of justice. But uh, our question is, uh, but uh, we are sure that uh, we are not uh, making uh, perhaps uh, unintentionally something uh, that uh, actually is, uh, um, uh, how can I say, reinforcing uh, inequity that are, we are um, trying, uh, we are seeking to, to solve. So this uh, uh, last keynote of today will help us in reflecting about the relationships with, uh, between open education and uh, social justice and how we can avoid the risk to go always in the same direction with other means. So I am very happy to introduce Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams, Associate Professor from the University of Cape Town. Please, Cheryl. Right, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the, for the introduction. Um, but I want to ask you, for a moment, I want you all to close your eyes. I, I can see from here, so. <laughs> close your eyes and just feel the chair you're sitting in. Feel it. Feel your back against the back of the chair. Feel your arms. Feel your feet firmly on the ground. Take a deep breath in and out. And open your eyes when you're ready. Today I hope by using some principles of fabric making that I'm going to help assist in helping us envision or re-envision the intertwined relationship between social justice and open education. 
Perhaps some terms before I get into the detail. For many of us nowadays, when we talk about fabric making, we don't really know the details because much of this is done by technology. But if you are, um, or you were, interested in fabric making, you would know that the, the warp threads, the threads that run along longitudinally, are those that are kept stationary on a loom to keep the structure. So they're in tension the whole time. But they're there so that we can use the other threads, which are called the weft threads, to actually help us make the pattern. And it's by having these pillars, as it were, that actually keeps our pattern straight. So today I want to be using the idea of the warp and the weft and the weave, how those two things happen together to help us understand how open education and social justice are interlaced, interweaved and that we can't think of them separately. Because in fact, the idea behind open education um, is something where we, we, can th we implicitly think of uh, a social justice imperative. But today I want to be using the metaphor, so this is a metaphorical idea, I'm using the metaphor of the warp and weft to help us understand the structure upon which our open education is built, and to make visible, perhaps, some of the invisible or um, assumptions that we make where we're not quite um, certain or we, they're so implicit that we don't even kind of think about them, to make that structure clearer in our own minds and to be informing us to help us make those minute-by-minute decisions, as well as the decisions right at an international level that goes right up to UNESCO. So there's layers and layers that we're going to unpack today. But just for, for a moment, I just want to tell you that I'm using a fabric um, called Shwe Shwe, or Ishwe Shwe, um, which is a printed, dyed cotton fabric, um, widely used in South Africa. For clothing. It was originally dyed indigo, um, and, but nowadays it's made of many coloured um, fabrics, and um, most of the designs are fairly geometric. And in fact, in South Africa, it's, it's seen as the South African um, fabric, um, so it's kind of seen as like the South African version of denim or um, tartan, for example. So it's quintessentially South African. However, if we look back a little bit at the history, we come to understand that Shwe Shwe material was actually brought in to an African country by the settlers, um, primarily from Europe. Um, the Dutch and German settlers came in with an indigo fabric, which in fact they had received from India. So there was a, there's a whole history around how we have built upon previous technologies that now seem to be our own, but in fact have histories that go back centuries. So just making the point that South Africans feel that we own this fabric. What was really interesting, and you can't see it so well, but that's the image I have. Um, just last week, um, UNESCO had a, a big um, a congress and they had an exhibition um, around the perimeter um, of the offices in Paris at the, at the UNESCO headquarters and they had an installation called Walking the Indigo Walk where they had, I think it was 34 um, installations of indigo fabric um, where people were invited to present um, their versions of indigo fabric. There were many different countries, 34 I think in total, but not South Africa. For a South African, this seems incredibly odd because we see this fabric as our own. But before I continue, a little bit about my positionality. I'm in my late 50s, a white South African woman, um, 
of English 1820 settler and German heritage. In fact, next year we would have, my family would have been in South Africa for 200 years. But yet, I am a particular race within South Africa of a white race. I've had a Protestant upbringing, but I now attend a Catholic church. I have a Western education background, majoring in psychology, read, speak, and write English and Afrikaans, which is one of the traditional languages. But unfortunately, despite much, um, well, many attempts and um, a whole year's worth at university of learning um, Zulu and Tosa, I have not mastered them to be able to speak well enough or read or, write, or read better um, and not write at all. I was a primary school teacher and then moved into being a learning designer um, for computer assisted instruction. And for those of you sitting in the audience who are 50 and above will see in that terminology that I've used, computer assisted instruction, that kind of puts me in a category um, of people. Um, in the early 80s, where this was seen as um, a fairly top-down, behaviourist-informed approach. Um, I moved into becoming a university lecturer in learning design and research design, and of late I have been far more involved in research and a principal investigator of um, international and national and institutional research. Philosophically, um, I come from a position of a, a critical realism and I just say that up front so that you know that I, I have nailed my colours to the mast. I'm happy to take questions in the light of that later. And I'm married to a former academic who sadly is not very well at the moment. And why I say that is because my positionality that I bring to this discussion this afternoon that we're going to have influences what I know about open education, what I understand social justice to be. So what I would like you to do is now, just on your own, think about what is your positionality? What do you bring to this meeting this afternoon? Sorry, let me get started. Um, how might your stage in life, your nationality, your race, your ethnicity, your religious or spiritual affiliation, your disciplinary tap roots, your philosophical assumptions, your language competence, your experience, your relationships and life crises, how might these influence your perspectives? For a moment, Think about your positionality and how it may impact on your idea of what is socially just. I needn't tell you that we are in an economic crisis. It's growing by the day. And so are the inequities. We know this. We also are living in an environment of extreme social uncertainty and inequality. We know this. We are also living in times of extreme political illegitimacy and exclusion. To what extent we're beginning to understand, thinking about the protests around the world this year, we are in a crisis as a world and that is going to impact on education as well. This is a world yearning for socially just education. So what is social justice? And there are many interpretations. Um, so today I'm going to be using the work of Nancy Fraser, who is a political philosopher, to help guide me through this presentation that I'm offering you today. But it's not to say that this is the only way about thinking about social justice. There are many different ways. And in fact, how we theorize social justice and how we actually implement social justice 
are in fact perhaps two different things. So if we see social justice as a concept that requires some kind of social arrangement that makes it possible for everyone to participate equally in society, um, that is one interpretation of social justice. Fraser talks about social justice as parity of participation, being equal, but not just equal generally, she divide, divides it up into being equal economically, culturally, and politically. So she talks about social justice, or the injustices rather, the economic injustice, or what she terms maldistribution. So we've got funds that are not well distributed, the maldistribution. And she explains that people can be impeded from full participation by economic structures that deny them the resources they need to interact with others. We know this well in our own education environment. What we are needing is economic equity. This is a big ask, but this is what we are needing to look at. Likewise, culturally, Fraser talks about cultural inequality or misrecognition. So in other words, we are not fully recognizing other cultures. We disregarding cultural histories, cultural practices, and other values. What we're needing instead is more cultural diversity. Politically, the injustice is one of inequality, or what Fraser terms misframing. And this is quite an interesting topic because what she's talking about here is who has the decision-making power? Who is included in and who is excluded from those people who are making the decisions around the, the economic decisions and making the cultural decisions? Initially, when Fraser wrote her theory about social justice, she just had the first two concepts. Um, economic and cultural. And through critique of her own work, she realized that there actually was a political issue around who makes those decisions. And in fact, that's what I'm hoping to show us today, is that we have all three issues to think about. What we're looking at and aiming at is political inclusion. So social justice can be understood as an outcome where all our relevant social um, actors can participate as peers in our social life, as well as a process. So it's not just a thing that actually we achieve at the end, but it is a process in which we are involved. And social um, open education has an explicit social um, justice intent where we um, explicitly look, not necessarily under these names, but we're looking for economic equity, cultural diversity, and political inclusion. And in fact, if we go all the way back to the Cape Town Open Education Declaration 12 years ago, um, which I and Werner, Werner, are you here? Werner. Werner and I, anybody else who was there that I've missed? Gladden and I were privileged to be part of this amazing group of people who put the Cape Town um, Open Education Declaration together. And looking back at Fraser's theorizing and re-looking at that definition that people worked through for days and days on end, I see that we had those threads there all the time. It's just, it's almost like a recognition um, of what was there. I mean, look at the phrasing, everyone should have the freedom. That is a political statement. Um, for education to be accessible and more effective, that is an economic argument. And the participatory culture is a cultural statement. So all along, these threads were there. We just may not have recognized them as succinctly as it is using a theory such as Fraser to help us think through um, what open education might look like if it's socially just. 
and open education itself. Um, and there have been many different um, interpretations of open education at this conference, and it's a movable feast. And in fact, even for myself, when I first got to understand open education, um, it was through the idea of open education resources. But even then, I have to say, there was a, there was a move um, in 2002 to, from UNESCO to call this area Open Education Resources. But when we were at the Cape Town Open Education Declaration meeting, we actually made a decision not to limit it to resources. And in fact, to take the broader concept, open education. And for a while, what happened is after 2002, our focus was on open education resources. And we went down the resources track for quite a while until we started realizing that underneath these resources are open practices. You can't actually easily make a resource without some kind of open practice. And so the open practice um, uh, movement um, ideas, I mean, Catherine Cronin's quite well associated with these, but there were others who were sp speaking about um, this idea of open, sometimes open pedagogy, um, sometimes open education practices. But for me, when I look at products now, I think of um, not just open education resources or open textbooks or open MOOCs, forgive me with the two opens there, but we know from some of the discussions here that MOOCs are not necessarily open in our understanding, but also open data. Because one of the things that in fact we may still need to recognize is that we've been perhaps excluding our research gaze from our education gaze and in fact, we perhaps need to bring in our understanding of how we share research data into the fold of the things that we actually use as education resources. Likewise, with open educational practices, I'm making space in my head for open research as well, because it's some of those practices in open research that in fact help us understand open education resources, uh, open education practices better. And that's certainly been my experience. And likewise, our communities. Um, we talk about open education communities, and at this conference, those are some of the ideas we've been sharing. But it's also part of the broader open science movement. So how can a social justice lens help us better understand how to optimize open education? What is the economic value proposition of open education. Yes, equitable access. And in fact, um, we understand from what most of the research that's been undertaken so far has focused primarily on this, this issue, the issues of costs, reducing costs um, to the individuals directly, their parents, the bursars, the government, whoever is involved in um, finding um, and sourcing and paying for the resources. It's also another value proposition is that it gives us an opportunity to get students to be able to have access to current research and hopefully enable students to study at their own pace and time and anywhere without the associated costs of traveling and staying at a residential university. So what I'd like you to do now is find somebody next to you and if you can't find somebody, get up and find someone. And I want you to think about and talk about what examples of more accessible and affordable education have you heard about in this conference? What examples of more accessible and affordable education have you heard about at this conference? Okay, I'm going to give you two minutes because there's two of you. <laughs>
Right, thank you. 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 So I'm not going to ask about those right now because the conversations that we have having in these small groups are the important ones. So I'm going to move on from this um, uh, idea to sharing some idea of what, how I have been working, looking at creative ways of um, using funding um, in an open environment. And this happens to be open research right now, but in fact, um, it's a project that our South African government have actually um, given us funding for, and we're doing two things. Firstly, we are investigating what um, they term open learning. So we're looking at cases on open learning. And I have to thank Sukaina Walji for the little abbreviation, the COOL project. <laughs> and in our COOL project, we are both investigating open learning um, in South Africa, so it's a national project, but at the same time, we are um, employing young, um, recently graduated master's students or PhD students or even somebody who already has a PhD to also build their research capacity and give them opportunities for publication. So where we would have thought about um, open research in one way, um, we have now got two ways of looking at a process and an outcome. So our outcome is looking at open learning and our process is um, a research capacity building. I must say, at the same time, I am learning so much in the process of um, working with my um, researchers um, as uh, I have a group of mentors and advisors as well. I'm not sure whose capacity is being built. But nevertheless, that is a, a, it is a way of using funds in a clever way to try and extend the remit um, of a, a way of using our um, economy, uh, economic, um, with, work within our economic constraints. So, just as an example, getting now to the cultural value proposition. Um, Fraser thinks about the value proposition culturally um, as deconstructing. And in fact, my colleague and I, um, Henry Trotter and I, wrote a paper um, in 2018 that actually made an argument for what we termed re-acculturation. So in other words, in order to achieve cultural equity and diversity, it's not just deconstructing so that we land up with all the other the pieces. We're trying to get to a position where we re to a position where we have a plurality of, of um, epistemic positions. In other words, different ways of understanding the same concept. Because given the fact that we have got a crisis in our world and we've been following a particular view of knowledge, perhaps it's a good time now, as any, to be able to look at other interpretations of how we might run a society. So what we want to do is perhaps be re-evaluating devalued knowledges. And I say this whether you come from Africa, Asia, Canada, the United States, Europe, Asia, wherever you come from, where have we been devaluing knowledges? And in fact, maybe we've also got to be acknowledging and respecting perspectives from various marginalized groups, religious groups, differently abled, a range of gender, ethnicities, nationalities, as well as asserting the value of lesser used languages. The fact that I'm speaking to you in English and that you are needing to ask questions in English is around a cultural hegemony. <laughs> English has claimed the space 
this may be for a number of years, but maybe there will be a different language in time to come. We have got to realize that there's not just one language that actually predominates. And maybe technology will help us. Maybe one day we'll be able to be communicating um, in different languages and, and understanding each other mutually. But in the interim, we need to be conscious about the languages that we don't necessarily value and how to promote those that are lesser used. So now in terms of looking at the culturally inclusive open education, I have heard quite a few very interesting um, presentations. So in groups of three, see if you can come up with at least one idea of a culturally inclusive open education project that you have heard about in this conference. And you have three minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. By the volume in the room, it would sound like you have more than one idea. <laughs> Just to give you an example from one of the uh, national project I'm running, um, this is um, just a little screenshot, for which I have permission, by the way, to use, um, of a, a Zoom meeting. Of, because our researchers come from all different parts of the country in South Africa, Cape Town, Johannesburg, Bloemfontein, um, Port Elizabeth, um, who have I missed out? Johannesburg. Um, so we can't get together. In fact, we have yet to meet some of the, the researchers face to face. We have only seen them on Zoom, yet we are running a collective open research project. 
And in fact, we need to be very mindful about how we did this in terms of being sensitive to languages. So even though English is our um, language of communication, most people don't speak English as their mother tongue. Um, secondly, in terms of understanding um, who feels confident enough to talk, we had to make sure that we were actively being, trying to be socially inclusive. And in fact, my challenge to you today is even though we're talking about these big cultural diversity issues, where, where it's enacted is in the particular. The, the every single moment decisions is where you make that happen. So you can talk about social justice and cultural inclusivity in general, but where it happens in, is in the moment where you take a chance to sit back and look at who's actually being involved in this conversation and who might need an invitation to have their opinion heard. All right, so the third element, we're looking at the uh, political value proposition. So this is what Fraser calls reframing. So in other words, we've got a frame right now that is quite Western, quite English dominated in terms of how we understand it. Who's deciding about what curricula are out there? Who's deciding what textbooks are out there? Whether they are open or not, there's some political decisions being made around what gets valued. So what we want to be looking at is to challenge some of these hegemonic knowledges. Um, but also, and this, in this case, I'm actually speaking directly to those from the Global South, um, and saying, we have got to contribute. It's not a case of just saying, no, what we don't want. Well, what do you want instead? Let us hear about what those alternatives are so that we can give people a choice. Likewise, we need to think about decision-making power um, to those who are usually seen as subordinate to the dominant power. And that happens right from the top level, from UNESCO um, recommendations, et cetera, all the way down to how do you actually get students to contribute in your class. And I was very struck, Robert, which I have added to the presentation after I heard you speak, was around trust your students. And um, I think I hadn't phrased it quite like that, but I think if I've got to say trust my researchers, um, it, it would have an impact on my own um, practice. And in fact, even though I hadn't phrased it like that, um, what happened, I'm just going to hop here for a second, what happened in the um, COOL project is one of the researchers suggested that they had a private reading group, one which didn't include the principal investigator and the advisors and the mentors. So we rejiggled our funds a little to have a little extra um, money made available to um, the student, a student, she's a PhD student, but um, she's a researcher, to gather some of those materials. She's had a little bit more experience in social justice and to run these reading groups. So in this sense, I was actually trusting the researchers, even though I hadn't phrased it like that, Robert. So, just going back for a sec, um, if you'd been good and followed my fours, but that doesn't matter, <laughs> if you can think of examples of, and you can't have Roberts, um, opening up power to decide about curricula, assessment, and accreditation that you've heard about at OE Global, technology supported or not. Four minutes.
Right, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. So one group said this was a hard one. Um, I, can I see some nods? Okay, so this is where our future thinking comes in. This is the stuff we've got to grapple with. Um, and it's not easy. There's no clear idea. But I think what I want us to just take away with us is a sense of when we're talking about how social justice can help us to better develop OER, open education practices, open education communities, I think the thing is what we need to be foregrounding is that we need to think through the economic issues for each of these layers. So it's like a fabric where every thread counts. You may have your economic um, warp thread that's holding it tight, but the way you weave your open education practices, the different pro programs you uh, create, as if it's a MOOC or materials or a set of beautiful simulations that we heard about this morning, um, you need to think through the economic issues right from the start, not as an end in of itself, because the costs don't go away. As um, James just said, it's, it's, it's cost shifting. Somebody is actually paying for this. And I think my challenge is, who are the people who are actually going to benefit from students having um, more efficient and cheaper educational resources? Who are these people? We've got to try and think um, with the end in mind. Lena, you talk, is that Lena? Uh, you were talking about that earlier. Likewise, we've also got to think um, when we're mediating things digitally that we've got uh, many people in the world who may not have this kind of access. It's so ubiquitous here, but it is not necessarily, and I'm not just talking Africa. So we need to think through the economic but at the same time, when we're talking about open education resources, we need to be looking at the disciplines. And we've heard such wonderful examples, I think, of projects that have been based around a particular problem. So it wasn't just open for open sake. And I think we as a community need to be very careful that we don't slip into that. Because it's open because it makes good sense. It makes good economic, it makes good cultural sense. And often the problem arises right in the particular, the particular discipline. And we've seen many examples of those who received awards, and we've seen many examples of projects that have actually involved, whether it's statistics or medicine or whatever, they have involved a particular problem. And we need to be thinking quite carefully culturally of um, images that we have used um, to represent things. It's little, it's these tiny changes. Likewise, um, we need upfront to think about how might something be disability friendly. Even it's in the, the simplest way in using styles, which a, an e-reader can translate into um, appropriate heading levels. Something as little as that can make the hugest difference for somebody who is differently abled. Likewise, we want to be looking, in, um, looking at an inclusive um, set of opinions that we include, obviously. And then likewise, politically, um, when we're looking at our materials, who is having a say over those perspectives? Who, who's making decisions? Whose perspectives are actually being included or not? So it's great that we've got the Open Education Declaration um, that's been accepted by UNESCO, because that too is a political statement. And the, the fact that uh, countries have to report on that is absolutely fabulous because they're going to have to have something to say, we hope. It would be very silly for them to go up and say, we, we've got nothing to say. So maybe that will help in terms of understanding resources, but that's not going to be enough. We've got to look far more carefully at the practices that underlie these um, education um, resources. And I'm not going to go through each one of these, but just to highlight, 
in terms of um, taking time, and we've seen people here taking time to reuse, adapt, and reshare materials. Um, because one of the challenges in the OER movement has been that people have been so ready to put materials out there, but really not to reuse in ways in which would be optimizing open education. Likewise, we need to look quite carefully at the cost of co-creation and collaboration. How much can you expect your students to give of their own free time? How much can you expect of academics lecturers to give of their free time. We, we've got to understand that there is a decision to be made here and not to try and paper it over. Likewise, in terms of our cultural content, the inclusivity of di and, um, diverse um, opinions, the perspectives, the decisions, all come up again, but this time in the practices. And likewise, in our broader communities, and I mean, I see us here as an open education community. The fact that OEC is the same abbreviation as the Open Education Consortium may just be accidental, but I certainly see the OEC as a, um, a community, an enabling um, space to kind of hold together this community. But there are costs to participation. Costs for us to be here today have been immense. Whether you're coming from Japan or South Africa, or China, um, we, we need to be aware of those costs of participation and um, think through how we might ameliorate those. The values, the cultural traditions, once again the diversity. And here we need to be mindful of our positionality. And one of the things that I have learnt, some really hard lessons, is that we can be very blind to our own position. And we've got to relearn new ways of being with people. And it's hard, and I'm not talking in theory now, I'm talking in practice. And likewise, to look at the, the decision-making around these communities that we are participating in. And the big channel, ch challenge to us is that the economic and the cultural and the political are inextricably interwoven. So we can't really pull just one piece out. And that may be why, in many instances, some of our materials aren't being, uh, those created, aren't actually being as well reused as they should be. Because it's actually come with just an economic benefit. It'll be cheaper if you use the same material. But if the same material is not culturally relevant, then it doesn't matter how cheap it is. So this is the, the issue, and who's deciding about what actually gets out there? We need them all together. And likewise, we're needing them simultaneously. So while we can think about, the, okay, let me think about the economic issues here, let me think about the cultural, let me think about the political, in action, they all happen simultaneously. In those moment by moment, decisions that we make, um, whether it's in our own classrooms or whether it is being a representative on a UNESCO um, committee. So for a moment, close your eyes and think about three things that you might do differently after this conference. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions in one minute? Otherwise, you can nail me tonight at the, at the dinner, and I will be around tomorrow, because there are people here who I can just see I'm going to want to have many conversations with. 
I know we've got a dinner coming up. So unless there's a pressing question, don't see any hands. Everybody's going to get ready in their glad rags. Just one last comment, by the way. Um, the presentation that I ran is actually in Google Docs, and you all have commenting rights. So please feel free to comment, challenge the position that I've taken. Thank you. <laughs>